This good-looking Gary Oak tree grows on the southern tip of Vancouver Island. We are in Victoria, British Columbia, right next to a Victorian-era mansion known as Craig de la Casa. A really impressive building, just in case you didn't catch the spelling, that's how that's written. A Scottish name for a building built in the 1880s for a Scottish immigrant family, the Donsmer family, who made their money in the coal business pretty well, I say. Out in the yard, after property rezonings, a number of Gary Oaks remain intact. Two of them are there. There's a third one behind me. A nice specimen. Technically, it's on someone else's property today. A number of Gary Oaks grow along that side of this yard or enclosure. And one in the middle here. I can reach the low-hanging branches on this one. Although, technically, this one also grows on the other side of the fence. But that's okay. In this video, I'll share with you some of the botanical features that help identify Gary Oak and we'll share with you some of its fascinating ecology to help appreciate Gary Oak. The name of the tree, Gary, comes or is named after a, a bureaucrat who worked for the Hudson's Bay Company in the early part of the 19th century. So Gary, scientific name of the species is Quercus Garyana. Gary Oak. Gary Oak is really similar to the English Oak. Both are in the English Oak is Quercus uh, robur, but uh, both species are really easily distinguishable. I'll show you in this video and we'll talk about some of those differences as well. So Quercus robur versus Quercus Garyana. Gary Oak is an arid or semi-arid region oak, even though here in the Pacific Northwest it it only gets this favorable condition in July and August when it's almost completely precipitation free. Gary Oak's natural habitat extends from in the Pacific Northwest from the southern tip of Vancouver Island and a few isolated patches along the southern or lower run of the Fraser River down along the coast not so much high in elevation there is uh, there are a lot of mountains in this area so just just whatever is at sea level roughly down through Washington, Oregon, and ending in Northern California. That's Gary Oak's natural range. Its ecology is tied to grasslands. It's not a coincidence that I try to film this in, uh, in a yard over a lawn. Just imagine, instead of an easily limbed lawn, natural grasslands with long grasses. So that would be Gary Oak's natural habitat. Gary Oak is intolerant of shade and competition from competing species. So I hope shade intolerance is fairly obvious out here in the open. Its main competitor species that, uh, that will overgrow whatever remaining uh, grasslands are or Western Red Cedar over there and Douglas fir. I don't have a Douglas fir in sight, but uh, those species outgrow and outcompete Douglas fir and or uh, Gary Oak and Douglas fir and Western Red Cedar will convert the grasslands into forest lands. Now the grasslands here in the Pacific Northwest in this range are not flat grasslands like in the prairies. No, narrow strips of grass, grasslands in the valleys along rivers or creeks or whatever. So narrow strips warm and somewhat arid and that's it. So that that's how Gary Oak's natural habitat looks like. It's a niche habitat, home to a number of n native, rare and endangered species of plants and animals. Gary Oak's natural habitat was maintained both by uh, the grasslands, were both maintained by native North American indigenous groups of people who, control, who, con who practiced control burning of grasslands to kill off uh, competing species of trees, uh, those uh, seedlings and saplings would burn out with the grass. Uh, Gary Oak is quite water, uh, quite fireproof in this regard if it's uh, just a grass fire underneath it. Now, uh, with today's lack of burn, and some of these burnings were also, of course, naturally occur just by lightning strikes. So in today's ecosystems where control burnings are gone, uh, Gary Oak's uh, natural groves and grasslands are being grown over by forests. The native North American population here 
before contact with European and other immigrants included these grasslands. They farmed these grasslands, they used uh, Gary Oaks uh, acorns and other parts as well and used the grasses and species and, and uh, other plants uh, that are part of the same ecosystem for foraging food and, and, and gathering food in that ecosystem. So it was an important source of food for them to maintain the grassland a grassland. They were motivated and they did so with these controlled fires. So, like I said, Gary Oak is a white oak. Let's take a look at its leaves, because that means that the leaves, leaf lobes are rounded, not pointed. It's fairly obvious. Just as soon as we look at one of them, they're rounded leaf lobes. And on Gary Oak, these lobes are, or the leaf is deeply divided with these notches. The leaf itself, in contrast to English oak, to which this leaf is otherwise fairly similar, is that the leaf is leathery, coarse and textured. You can see its surface, maybe a close that it's maybe not warty, but it's it's not smooth. It's coarse and textured and somewhat bumpy or leathery. Okay, I hope that makes sense. This texture makes sense. Now another feature that identifies it is how the, the leaf stalk here is really, really short, but about, I don't know, between one and two centimeters, something like that. Let's get a good picture there. So English oak's leaf stalk here is under a centimeter, typically. Another feature is that Gary Oak's leaf margin here, how it meets this leaf stalk is just like this. It gets rounded and then it just transitions to a leaf stalk. Now on English oak, this transition is done along an S curve or a double sinusoidal curve. English oak's leaf margin goes down and then comes back up and goes down again and then goes into the, or continues as a leaf stem. So it's an S shape on both sides of the, of the uh, main vein here. Okay, and Gary Oak's leaf margin just continues and just meets the leaf stalk just like so. It's a short leaf stalk. So, so if you have leafy, uh, you know, summer trees, you check out the base of the leaf, the texture of the leaf. Uh, it's obvious that this is Gary Oak. Some other features include uh, that the leaf is not only textured on the upper side, but also fuzzy on the underside, whereas English Oak is bare. So I don't know how much of this tan colored fuzz you can, I can capture. Let's see a leaf that I haven't turned over yet or haven't touched or rubbed yet. So this tan colored fuzziness is maybe not super visible, but, but it is there on a leaf that's not rubbed off just yet. Let's try this one, the last one. Okay, so it's fuzzy on the underside. Not only the leaf is fuzzy, but the terminal buds and all buds are fuzzy everywhere on Gary Oak. So this is a terminal bud, about half an inch long. On English Oak, the, these buds are rounded and bare. These ones, these, and, and just a few millimeters long, like three millimeters long on English Oak, like it's an eighth of an inch. This is half an inch long and fuzzy. So long, all the bud scales are big and fuzzy. Okay, and these buds are long. Okay, I hope this fuzziness makes sense. So, buds are elongated, the, le the bud scales are fuzzy. The, some of the pollen catkins are caught. They don't grow out of here, they're just caught here. As they fall, they kind of get caught. So, this is how some of the pollen catkins look like when, you know, months after they fall. Some of them still remain. And uh, if I can find an acorn here, this is how the acorns look like. What's immediately obvious is that the acorns don't grow on stalks. They are stalkless. They just grow out of the shoots as is. And about half the acorn cup covers the acorn and the cup is a little bit leafy, but not so much, something like that. I've seen a few other acorns somewhere. Uh, here, is, here are two of them. Let's take a look at these two acorns there. So they are stalkless. They can grow singly or 
two or two of them. That's how I found them so far. There's another two of them here. And uh, like I said, on English oak, they grow on long stalks. Uh, one, two, or three. Most of them two on a longer, less long stalk. So not even near the case. So even if you have a Gary oak or a questionable oak uh, and you can't find leaves on them or acorns, the bud scales and the fuzziness on the buds and the length of the buds are uh, fairly easy uh, giveaways and if you find these leaves fallen on the ground uh, they, uh, you can look at the base of the leaf okay so that that can still help if you find a tree in the winter and you look at it and you try to see if it's English oak or Gary oak so that's how you can tell the two species apart uh, they are fairly similar and maybe a close-up on the bark the crown is fairly irregular just like so good timber very nice and as white oaks go, white oak has a porous uh, system where the vessel elements are blocked off by a series of membranes along its length that make w the wood of white oak species waterproof. So prime barrel and ship material, ship hull material was made out of white oak species, English oak being the main species, but Gary oak is the same family. So that's how the bark looks like. Very, very, the ridges are very narrow. There's my hand in it for scale size and it's really, really deep uh, fissures here that are in the bark and it's fairly uniform. Un unbroken ridges in the bark is how the bark looks like on mature barks looks like but looks like on Gary Oak so those are the botanical features and uh, that's its uh, ecology thank you very much for watching